Well, it's a great pleasure to have some of my panels here today. Uh, I'm here to talk about constraining couplings of any world variables. Right. Well, uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, giving me the chance to escape cold Canadian winter <laughs> and be now in, in rainy Texas. Um, yeah. I'll talk about um, work. Well, actually, like a couple of different works, really. Um, most recently, um, work in progress with uh, Jeep Lee, who's a grad student at Perimeter, and Ashish Shukla, who's a um, postdoc in Paris. Um, but also, sort of like a lot of what I'm saying in particular, so like the initial review part is based on a really series of papers, some of which I wrote the uh, last year. And then some of which I've written the years, uh, the year before with uh, Mr. Chandra Myers, Ignacio Reyes, and uh, Josh Sander. Okay, oh, you have to click on it. Yeah, okay. Let's see if that, yeah, okay. Wonderful. All right. And so, so like a, the common theme of a lot of this work is really that um, it deals with other world brains. And uh, world brains are essentially plain words, bottom up models for. Defects in space time. And they very recently played um, an important role, I would say, in, in a lot of different um, works, which sort of revolve around understanding one guy. One thing is they play an important role in the understanding of how to compute the entropy of evaporating page curves, in particular higher dimensions using the so called island formula. And I will sort of like very briefly say a few words about this. Then they seem to give an option to embed cosmology into the usual sort of ABS CFT paradigm of holography. And they've also been used, for example, in this work um, to model particular black hole microstates and explain certain features of the uh, sort of like new insights people have gained over the last, say, like two years or so, two or three years um, of quantum gravity. And so the rough plan for this talk is somewhat twofold. First, I will try to give like a lightning review of another world brains and the concept of uh, holography, um, just to like cover what's what's happened over the past sort of like two years and give hopefully sufficient motivation um, why that's an interesting field of study. And then after this, I will change gears a bit and look at a particular different example of um, application of end of the world brains um, where they are located behind like all horizons. And can act as models or cosmologies, and then try to constrain their physics a bit. Um, oh yeah, by the way, so so a lot of what I'm talking about, particularly towards the end, will be work in progress. So I hope, um, well, I, I hope that this is going to be like somewhat informal. So please interrupt me uh, with questions at any time. Okay, so what are end of the world brains? End of the world brains are three solutions uh, to the system described by this action here. Are actually consists of three parts: the bulk action, which is just standard um, Einstein gravity with a negative cosmological constant for looking at ADS spaces, and then um, we have we imagine our geometry to be cut off at some point um, by a brain, which sits at a finite distance from points in this geometry, and that's described by this brain action, which consists of two pieces. One piece is this expensive curvature piece, so the standard. Given talk in your boundary term, which is needed to make your uh, variational principle well defined. And then we also provide our brain with a constant tension, which is sort of like all of those coefficients here. Um, but really, what I'll focus on, I'll just call this dimensionless parameter T0, the tension, and then in your head, you have to multiply all of this if you're actually in the tension. Um, and then we also have um, an asymptotic boundary in our space time. And the action of this asymptotic boundary is again the given talk in your term, plus then, and that depends on the number of dimensions here, but counter terms which make the on the shell action um, well defined. Okay, so if you take this action, you vary it, you get your standard plot equations of motion, and the solution I'll be mostly interested in are sort of like various incarnations um, of ADS vacuum. I also have to look at it in Rindlock coordinates, so to mimic black holes. And then you, you get um, boundary terms, which at the asymptotic boundary, um, you have a vanishing boundary term simply because it's um, the metric. But at the brain, we want to allow we, be, we want to allow the metric to fluctuate, and so we choose Neumann boundary conditions, which sets so like this whole 
um, combination of extrinsic curve is k and the induced metric h to zero. And you see that gives us a relation between uh, the parameter t zero and uh, and the extrinsic curvature. Okay, just just sort of sort of like little side remark. Um, these models were studied like more than twenty years ago by Reynolds Hunter and Carl Randall, in particular for the PDS case. And there, the construction was slightly different in that what I call the end of the bulk gradient here, which terminates based on actually sits inside the bulk and warps the bulk a lot. Um, but the physics is exactly identical. Um, what happens sort of in, in those older models is you have an Israel junction condition across the brain that gives you essentially the same equation. Is but the brain infinitely extended? Uh... In, in the model, I will be discussing yes. Um, there's, I will I'll also just, yeah, I guess in the model, I will be discussing yes. Either it's an ADS metric, and so it's in that respect, or I'm looking at planar by holes later, and then of course you have a translation. Doesn't that create some problems at the boundary uh, if you are concerned about boundary boundary conditions? Um, if today, is it a rigid geometry, planar brain? It's, it's not necessarily a planar brain, right? It will be like curved. So, so it has to, like the trajectory, and we'll see, like has to be so this equation of motion. And so that's a solution to this, to, to like Einstein gravity, which, you know, is a uh, which is extreme of, of your action and normal variation. And you ensure this by making sure that the brain obeys um, this condition. Okay, okay, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, what this gives us, if we sort of like feed this into the usual ABS CFP paradigm, is in fact a trialgic theory. So that's sort of like the very nice and interesting thing about it. Um, here I've sort of drawn. Um, a picture of an out of the world brain that's the big black line up here, which cuts off the gray ADS bulk um, with the asymptotic boundary down here by this thin black line up here. I hope you can see this like a dotted black line, just of like where the asymptotic boundary uh, would have been had it been cut it off. And now, if we apply ADS CFT, what we find is that this here um, is dual to a boundary control. Boundary control field theory, right? Because our asymptotic boundary itself has a boundary indicated by these like green squares here. And we can imagine additional degrees of freedom, and generally we want to imagine additional degrees of freedom um, living here. Now, the location of this brain is controlled by this uh, aforementioned parameter T naught. And what it essentially does is sort of like sets the brain in locations of different extrinsic curvature, and that more or less means moving the brain into up and down here. And you can think of this as sort of um, as being controlled in this picture, what I call the boundary perspective, uh, by the number of degrees of freedom you add to this PCFT boundary. Now, this one has like a very interesting limit, namely, as I said, the tension um, to one in my normalization, um, two effects essentially. One is that gravity, what's called locally localizes. In other words, the graviton wave function developed. Gets a new motor strongly localized around this brain and acts essentially um, deep, like as a d-dimensional graviton in the vicinity of the brain. And secondly, and you can see this like from all of these pictures very nicely, this brain, um, as T goes to one, approaches the boundary up here and really acts like an IR regulator of the bulk. Now, again, going back to ADC or D, this essentially means that we put with that that uh, you might have a holographic description and a CFT, but now we impose a UV cutoff. So this IR cutoff brain really turns the forms to UV cutoff in the CFT. And so in summary, in this limit, what we expect is that there's an alternative description of the system as follows. We have our asymptotic boundary with the CFT, which is coupled to a region of dynamical gravity now here in green, where we have a cutoff CFT. And this situation can be made more precise by doing a holographic renormalization and realizing that the onshell action, usually at the um, asymptotic boundary, gives you, if you add um, renormalization terms, the um, effective action of your CFT. Now, here near the brain, we don't add renormalization terms, but we can you know, add and subtract um, the counter terms. And so near the brain, by adding the counter term, we again get a CFT. Um, action 
And then subtracting the counter terms effectively generates dynamics for gravity because in this limit, the counter term action looks like Einstein gravity plus higher curvature corrections and these higher curvature corrections become small in this limit. Is the if you go back maybe to your previous yeah. equation of motion, is, is it obvious that what's happening when T is equals one? Is it? Um it has some application. Yes. Yeah, so um, okay, let me let me say two words about this, and I will sort of like show you a different model, but it means a different model. Uh, um, so when t is here equals to one, then from this point of view, the brain would just like hit the boundary and nothing makes sense more. However, um, there are other solutions where the brain now becomes a horror sphere and sort of just like it touches the um, boundary down here, and then you in fact end up with the um, Randall Sandra model. Can I assume that uh, you have a symptotical here you have space back here? Right. So, I mean, like, just imagine, I uh, think of this right now with ADS vacuum, which is terminated by the brain at some point. And can I also assume that the, the, the brain is wrapping the boundary? Like, the told me you told that the brain is going to be Well, it's not, that's, the, the point here is it's not wrapping the full boundary, right? That's important. It just, like, cuts off part of the boundary. Wow, ah, okay. Right? So, we, we, we still have this DCFT descriptions. A description which I sort of want to think of as the, the true UV definition of my system. Uh, and so, sort of like the DCFT together with these defect degrees of freedom give rise to a bulk which contains the same asymptotic region, but then also like a large like volume which then is terminated by another brain. So, that means that you have an open brain that is on the boundary. So, in your view, do you consider shared the symmetric brain residing on the boundary? Why, uh, right, right. So, right. So, this would be uh, this would be an open layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's important, right? Because here, what, what we have is, if, if you will, this is as we which is in contact with a theory which now lives on the brain. So, they, they share an interface. So, this is two degrees of the solving in here. Is it four dimensional triple gravity for not? So, right now, it's literally, sorry? right now, it's literally just this. Um, okay. Another point which I will make in a second is that's, of course, just sort of like a an effective model for solutions which would be much more complicated, um, but which at least some of them are known. So there's like classifications, so and you can support CPI mills and it's a boundary control of field theory. Yeah, this is your right, core model. This is your yes. basic story. Yes, yes. So some of those three terms. Exactly. Okay. And and it turns out like it's it's a good time model to reproduce like a lot of effects you expect from these more complicated things. Okay. So what dimension that you're working, I I saw the thing. Yeah, so I mean, the, the pictures I draw are like here are just like time, like time slices of ADS3, of course, but the whole story works in D dimensions, uh, and that's sort of like what makes it powerful and what people are interested in. Um, I will later when I talk about sort of like uh, cosmologies, just well, for a couple of reasons that I will talk about, um, I will also consider ADS3, but for now, the story is D dimensions. Okay. You said something about higher derivatives on the boundary. Right. Where do you get that from? Right. So, um, I mean, if, if you want to derive this, what you do is you do holographic renormalization. So you expand your bulk action. You sort of like see which um, which terms which are intrinsic to your cutoff surface. You have to add such that if you remove your cutoff, you cancel all the divergences, and that gives you like a, a constant term, a Ricci term, and then there's like higher. Um, higher infinitum. Well, not at in, in infinitum, but it like depends on the dimension you're in. Mm -hmm. So in four dimensions, you have like an R squared term, and that's about it. And then you can sort of like that finite stuff if you want to, but um, yeah. So if you only start from this action where you only have R, this is a time time, you will not get time here with this action. No, no, you will be right because the action, so the gravity action on so in the bulk, you have lines of like no higher yeah. corrections. Okay. On the brain, you have a gravitational action, which is sort of like which you can think of as minus those counter terms you would have to add. And these counter terms come with, like, look like Einstein gravity with higher curvature corrections. All right. Okay. So, what can you do with it? W one thing that has uh, usually worked like, uh, very well and produced very interesting results um, in holographic theories is computing entropies. So, uh, let me just, like, Bring us all on the same page. The thing we're interested in is the von Neumann entropy of the subregion A in the CFT. So the formal definition of this is minus trace rho A uh, log rho A, where rho A is the reduced density matrix 
of the state on the subject A. Of course, really in quantum field theories, this thing doesn't formally exist, um, but it's sort of like a useful fiction to believe it exists and um, it sort of agrees sufficiently well with like formal treatment. Now, agreeing these things is very hard. In particular, it's very hard if you like a strongly coupled quantum field theory, except for the fact that if your theory is holographic, you can use what's uh, known as the Ryu-Takayanagi formula, which tells you that the entropy of a subregion A is given by the smallest extremal surface in the bulk homologous to A. As you might have seen these pictures before, so we have our asymptotic boundary here, the region A, and then the correct small extremal surface is given sort of by a region that caps off A here. On the presence of those brains, the rule of the homology constraint is actually slightly weakened. And that now the homology constraint only has to hold up to terms uh, which lie within the brain. Or in other words, we can now allow our RT surfaces to end on the brain. And so, as opposed to like the Senate ADS-CFP case, now here I have, a, I have an option of you know, having like another RT surface like so, which connects up to the brain. And which one of those now, or the area of which of those gives me the correct phenomenon entropy now depends on sort of like the exact model you're looking at of your parameters. And so on and so forth. Okay, so why is this interesting? One thing um, that uh, well, we've worked out in the reference um, is that it reveals the island formula. Now, the island formula is sort of like a novel prescription to compute entropies, uh, which allow you to compute a page curve consistent with unitarity for, say, evaporating black holes or black holes. Um, in contact uh, in contact with a thermal bath. Um, I'm not going to like explain the nitty gritty details, but I'm happy to like answer questions about this um, either now or after the talk. Um, but let me like very roughly just uh, tell you how this works. So if we look at this BCFT description, we're interested in um, the entropy of this region A in the case where we put a topological black hole, topological mass black hole into the bulk. Or in other words. We look at this in Rydberg coordinates. What's happening is that usually the RT sets, which would sort of like cross across the horizon, which I've indicated by these dashed lines here, that grows linearly with time, at least at many times. Now, the other candidate surface we have, so the one which connects to the brain, is constant in time. So even though this will be much bigger in like a limit where I set t equals to one or send t towards one. Um, since the, the other surface grows linearly, this will become at some point the smaller extremal surface, and thus the correct the Utakayanagi formula, and uh, will give us an entropy which will be constant time. So, for like uh, this model is really like a, a black hole in context of the thermal bath, where initially um, my entropy grows, and then at some point the growth terminates and like flattens out. Does A refer to the segment of that uh, boundary curve? Or yeah, that's right. A, area? A, A is this segment down here. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, so in this picture, we sort of look okay, at the growth of entropy in this region A is sort of like terminates at some point. Now, if we go to the brain description or brain perspective of our model, um, that's not here. In particular, really, if we believe. This is described as like semi classical gravity with local degrees of freedom. Um, then our RT set is just like shouldn't be able to just like randomly end on the screen. Why? Because like the degrees of freedom down here are obviously independent of the degrees of freedom up here. Again, if we think that this is described by semi classical and local theory. Now, of course, the question is we've computed an area uh, or like we've computed an entropy here in this. UV complete description, can we sort of mock up this computation or send it as a classical picture? And the answer is yes, we can by defining um, an entropy functional, which is exactly this island time. So we allow for um, other regions B, which are anywhere here in this gravitational region, and compute the phonometry of A union B plus a penalty term proportional to the area of the boundary of B. And then we minimize, uh, extremize and minimize over B. Okay, so um, that's sort of like a nice picture, which sort of like gives perhaps hints on how semi classical gravity is actually related to like a quantum gravitational or like UV complete description. And, um, but this picture is like very powerful. 
right? So the reorganization of degrees of freedom, like how to go from here to here, can actually be studied using what's called entangled wedge reconstruction. That's um, just the statement that whatever is contained in my entangled wedge, so the region between um, A here and my RT surfaces, the, uh, the domain of dependence of this region, can be reconstructed on A in the CFT. Um, whereas here in this picture, my homology constraint from my RT is different. And so if I have to, like, say, this operator phi C here, then in this picture, the information about phi C is contained in the region A, whereas here, it will be sort of contained somewhere in the local degrees of freedom up here uh, near the brain. And I'm not going to say much more about this except for, like, uh, maybe a bit um, opaque statement that there's, like, a lot of conjectures and so on in the literature. And if you just, like, try to apply them um, sort of carefully, the picture that emerges very roughly speaking is that this brain perspective here sort of acts as a model of clearly classical gravity and can be understood as a reorganization of computationally very difficult to access degrees of freedom um, in this UV complete description. Now, in terms of local degrees of freedom, the other, uh, the other brain. Okay. What is the key object you're computing, uh, starting from the Lagrangian that you gave us between times? So, Can right you, uh, outline one object that you actually need. So, here you use uh, what you saw right now. Yes. Right. So, so here, um, like, I mean, the key object to compute here are Ryu Taka, well, are Ryu Taka and surfaces to study the way entanglements like you grow the area. The right? area. That's right. Yeah. To study, to study the entities. Then everything's sort of on top of this, like entanglement reconstruction and so on, are. Um, which are in some case proven, in some case like strongly supported by evidence that this is sort of like how holography works, right? I mean, you could you could ask me, okay, how do how do I prove that really entanglement wedge reconstruction is a true statement? Now, in practice, um, the argument, um, yeah, I think I'm not like I'm not really aware of like a complete gravitational argument, but the argument that is usually presented is that. You first ask how is information about the like actually encoded in the boundary, and you'll get to um, the concept of error quantum error correcting codes. And the statement is, oh, this is in the quantum error correcting code holography. And then you can prove within error, um, error correcting codes the entanglement reconstruction. This is true. Very quick two questions to compute the uh, area you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, which part of those three terms you wrote down and to capture? Well, what, no. terms, right? right. So what's what's important here is really the bulk term in that you know you just like define a surface, you look at the induced metric, you write on the area function for the surface, and that of course um takes from well, you know, like put the induced metric, which is like a solution to this uh -huh. action onto the onto the brain and then you extremize the area function. Okay. The second question was uh, what can you tell us about the CFT? Of course, yeah. So you said that there's a holography. Right, okay. right, right. What is the CFT here? Yeah. Right. So so again, right? I mean, like this, the same thing I'm just using here is that um as part of the ADS um spaces are generally the least reduced to holographic CFTs. Now, this is of course not a fully fledged model, right? I mean, in in the in the ideal world that we would like to have uh, you know like a complete model with any parts of being built, but then you have to worry about like the internal S5 directions and so on. Um, and so the only thing I say about the CFT here right now is that it's a holographic CFT. Okay. So it, it's like a it's like a large C CFT with like a with like a, a, a sparse uh, like a low lying sparse spectrum. Coordination case. What kind of three-dimensional CFT are you referring to? Is it uh, like a type model or? Yeah, I mean, if, if it's just four dimensional, right? I mean, like take the same example of like n equals to four, for example, right? It's really dual to string theory in a 10 dimensional bulk where you have like five internal di dimensions. And if you want to be like very careful, then you would have to also like note that really the presence of such a defect will do something to your internal dimensions and will break part of your formal symmetry. But I'm sweeping like the sweeping these things on the right right now. But in principle, those details are important for your story. Uh, 10 dimensional. 
inherited information inherited from NP are important for your community? no 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 I don't think it's important for this story. I mean, he was like reducing this down to the bare bones of like what's necessary to show this effect, and then you can start discussing: Do these end of the world brands really exist, right? Or like, is, is that like a reasonable low energy effective description of true stringy constructions? And that's something I will talk about. What we are gonna ignore the stringy aspects. Uh, there, there is a long story that in here the time signs for brains for one reason. Yeah. Shouldn't we be? Isn't it fair to ask what is this? There is a long PSP. In more detail in that case? Uh, well, I mean, it, it, again, right? So, what, what, what I'll get is like a large CCFG. Um, what I need, because I only need more about gravity in the bulk, is of course it's the NG tensor. Um, and then there's some constraints on the spectrum of the CFG. Energy constraints? Or, um, um, or? Well, there's like certain sparse constraints for like the low lying spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, what would you what motivate you to introduce violence? Let's say, I mean, no audience would be applied for you know the entirety of proportion right. But here there's a black hole. So what what is the motivation? So right. So the beauty of this is that the island probably comes out of it. You don't introduce it. The island formula, I say, oh, this is gone. The island formula, right? In this picture, is a so this computation here is just like a purely like holographic BCFT computation. And now I go to this interpretation here where I say, oh, am I, if I'm in this limit where gravity locally localizes and so on, then I have an effective description of the brain up here as a CFT coupled to gravity. And then if I answer the question, well, how can I sort of like reproduce this correct RT surface in this description? The answer is the other formula. So you can, you can prove that extremization and minimization of RT surfaces in this picture is equivalent to, to extremization and minimization of the island formula. Okay, I'm just gonna jump ahead and um, tell you like the second important point about these models. Um, and that is, of course, and that's been alluded to, right? It's gonna work by best descriptions. So that might be in like in like a true string, um, or, like theory of string model um, or super gravity model, right? You, you might have um, geometries like tapping off or um, or certain brains and whatnot. Um, and so Really, in the spirit of protective field theory, we should say, well, you know, why don't we have like additional couplings to like molecules and so on in the brain? And one particular, particularly interesting class of those, although they were like motivated slightly differently, is you can add an additional Einstein Hilbert term onto the brain. Why is this particularly interesting? Because it affects all these phase transitions I talked about. It affects the location where the RT surface can touch the brain. It affects when the phase transition is going to happen. There's like some uh, Weird effects where you can have so like self sustained uh, Ryu Takeranagi surfaces, um, which are homologous to nothing that are nonetheless stable and appear. And why that is is very easy to understood using this island formula because by adding this term to the brain, we modify the one over G Newton that uh, multiplies the area term of the boundary of the region B. And so here, this is sort of like the standard, um, so sort of like d dimensional. Um, Coupling if you ignore the CDP terms and then you can add this additional term and then you just like that one of the two brain. And of course, a priori, this coupling here can be like any, right? Like you can make this as big or as small as you want. What is delta T? Oh, delta T is just like, yeah, that's just like another so like counter term I bet it, uh, which sometimes is used for uh, like conveniently constructing these model surfaces. Um, I think it's okay to just okay, ignore it. Any matter I want, for example, I can introduce new fields. Right? Oh, I see. No, so, so right now, this is just like a constant. So, like, you know, you uh -huh. can this, like, split the particular part of, of this lambda brain. And the reason you do this is in, in like concrete constructions, um, it's just like on, like, you can evaluate the first two terms on shell and they will give you like a non zero result. And this that will change the location of your brain. And you don't really want that for practical purposes. You just like subtract it. Um, Cough in the end. But so it's, it's like, think of it as a comment. Constant. Okay. All right. Okay. So the app shows everything I've told you so far. Um, well, let me see. There's an interesting. Yeah. 
There's a question here. Oh, what's it? RT bubble. Okay. Um, yeah, I was hoping to like skip this part. Um, but right, let me like explain explain this really quickly. Um, on yeah, maybe this picture here. So if you do, if you make the CGP couple more this, right? What can happen? You can ask, well, what's the what's the um, entropy of sort of like the empty set? And again, the RT formula tells you what you want to do is you want to um, look at RT services which are homologous to whatever you had on the boundary, so like the empty set, which extremize the error function. Now, usually, you would think, well. You know, whenever I, whenever I put something into the bug, it has an unzero area, like I can't extremize this. But when you start introducing these CGP terms with a negative sign, what can happen is that there's actually non-zero areas which extremize your error function, essentially because they balance off against this negative um, EGP coupling. And so, so they're a bit weird and not really well understood what they they mean in detail. The one thing to note though is. That, as I mentioned before, right, the theory on the screen comes with, with a natural cutoff just due to the fact that it's sort of like an IR cutoff in the bulk. And these brains typically, or in all cases, you know, like yourself, are smaller than this cutoff. Um, so you might like disregard them as sort of like a weird effect, but you know, it's, it's a weird effect. And I think, in particular, if you want to constrain which values um, this company can take, it deserves like further study if they are problematic. I hope that answered your question. Um, right, okay, so the upshot of all of this um, is that the world brains give an interesting limit in this t equals one limit, um, where you sort of like a not a d dimensional semi classical theory, um, and that there's like a lot of quantum reputational effects. For example, this island homia that you now can study within this perspective, and using the bulk, you can sort of like learn about um, how your CFP, the boundary, uh, the boundary description relates to this brain description. How do you that in more detail? And then secondly, um, and I hope you to like believe this is not true, but of course this story isn't like limited to the particular model we're looking at, but um, the similar story should also hold sort of other mod models where there's localization um, of gravity. So models, um, for example, this model is describing distant, um, sorry, smaller these, and this is what I will refer to instead of now. Um, the important point here is that I think there's like a lot to learn about these kind of world brain models, and here's like a few examples where you can ask, is there an extrapolate dictionary for this brain theory? Um, how do you deal with the fact that the theory on the brain is sort of like a cutoff theory, so it has like a non-local non -local sort of like scale? Um, and there's like some work in progress, and also those people have written paper about this and then what i will talk about um, for the rest of this talk is the fact that a little bit of a description so we need to ask ourselves which solutions or parameters uh, can like even be feasible um and so that's what i will focus on now are there any questions about sort of i mean there were many were straight um but are there any more questions about what i said so far i'll still stop order And go on. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I mean, it looks a lot, it's just not that much. Um, I also like to discuss really quickly the role of end of the world brains as like microstates. Um, then I will go a bit into details about how we compute entropies um, in those models. Um, and then we'll talk about um, well the growth of these RT services, how it's related to evolution of information, and how we can place bounds on that. And then we'll just analyze like basic solutions or like basic solutions you can write down, and then also try to see what happens if we add to these problems. Okay, so how do we get brains like for microstates? Essentially, we take the same picture as before, and now we put a horizon across the picture so that behind the black hole there's a brain, and on the other side, I have an asymptotic boundary. If I take the section along the middle here, and uh, for time again, I get the picture on the right. Uh, which is made more familiar as a Penrose diagram of a black hole. On the right, I have an asymptotic boundary, which holds the CFD. On the right, uh, the left, the asymptotic boundary is cut off by a brain, which you know, might look like this for some other way. Um, why would I call them like microstates? 
first thing to note is that um, if you compute entropy, but the entropy of the full like boundary here, then that's uh, then the boundary reach is homologous to the brain. So the empty RT surface um, will extremize and minimize the area functional, or in other words, entropy is going to be zero, the six are zero. Um, there's a much like a bit more involved um, way of seeing this, uh, which is if you try to construct those models using the Euclidean path integral, um, then you essentially see that their um, boundary states in your CFT, which are evolved for a finite amount of time, but you see a time evolution. Um, and then they can look like this. Now, this Euclidean construction has some caveats, um, and that is that. These constructions really only work for the tension being smaller than some critical tension, which is not one, like in our case, for example, in four dimensions, I believe the upper bound is about 0.8 or so. And that's like way too small for gravity to localize. Um, so from a from like a detective point of view where I want to pretend there's a local detective field theory, like living on this brain, this parameter is not much too small, and then you can try to study all can like modify. Um, the, the Euclidean construction somehow by adding additional defects and GP terms and so on, that we can actually increase T to bigger than 0.8. Um, this work where they use charge black holes for this and so on. Um, anyways, I will not bother with any of this. I will just consider the Lorentzian solution. And then, of course, you know, that captures everything I can construct using a Euclidean path integral, but even more. Yeah. So, can you say that, like, this end of the or bring this this configuration gives you vanish entropy. That's why it's yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a pure state. But the point is, it looks so like thermal on the outside. It's on small states. Um, okay. So practically speaking, what I will do um, is to work with a planar AS3 level. And the reason why I'm doing this is because, first of all, in AS3 everything is like much simpler, and we can actually write down formulas, and you don't have to do like loads of things numerically. Um, and second, this is like all work in progress, and that's the case we understand best. Okay, so that's the metric. R plus is the like whole um, horizon radius, and elsewhere is the radius length scale. And then again, we want to cut off the left asymptotic boundary. Um, the equation that needs to obey by the, the brain here is this one, the extrinsic curvature is proportional to the used metric. That's just a rewriting of the big lengthy formula you see on the previous slides. Um, by T on over L. And then for those who are familiar with like the random sum construction, um, you know that like if you have one over L here, that's exactly the original an alternative to compact classification paper of random and syndrome with a minus sign, which is because that's a different uh, convention of the Right. And so what I also want to do is I want to use the translational symmetry in the transverse direction here. And so I put in a translation using many ansatz. Um, and that comes out of this. And so the first thing we want to do is we want to classify solutions to this equation. And we do this by reparameterizing um, the trajectory R by some sort of like dual proper time lambda. And so then this turns this into a part of the potential type problem where your kinetic energy, your potential, and your total energy. <laughs> and so this is you know how you read them, where an R go tells you where the brain could be. So for T naught smaller than one, R will start at zero, come out of the horizon, reach some maximum uh, some maximum value of R, turn around and fall back into the black hole. So we'll do something like this, right? Then 14 are bigger than one, we will either come out of the black hole and go to R equals to infinity, so the SLA boundary, or vice versa, I will start at the SLA boundary and fall into the black hole. And then there's this marginal case of T naught equals to one, where it will come out of the black hole and asymptotically approach the um, asymptotic boundary or again the time reflection, uh, the, the time reflection solution. Now you can like do the math and like find those trajectories. Um, here I'm showing them in crystal coordinates. And what you see is that for T naught small and one, the solution is typically like this. So it's just like a straight line in the Penrose diagram that's like very special to the three-dimensional case. And in fact, you have an infinite family of these solutions, um, which are related by short of time translations. But for us, what's re what really matters is like the entropy growth, so the, the derivative of the entropy, and that's of course um, independent of where you put your t equals zero coordinate. And so I will just like present or like fix 
um, towards all time in a way that I get like a very nice and special. Um, then for t equals to one, I have this situation where my brain comes out, like comes out of the past singularity, leaves the black hole, and then approaches the SLE boundary up here. So still, all of the SLE boundaries cut away by the solution, and I only do physics or like in this region. Um, and again, I have like the family of those times two, times two because that's the time reflected solution, and the family essentially tells you where exactly out of the singularity um, it really comes. And then for t not bigger than one, I have solutions of this type where my brain actually hits the asymptotic boundary on the left hand side. So here the boundary isn't cut off. And I would just like disregard those as not being microstates, right? Because I have a CF, like a CFT here, but I also still have part of my CFT on the other side. So this is not of interest to me. Okay, now what does this have to do with cosmology? It's a bit hard to argue for in, uh, in, in two or three dimensions respectively. In higher dimensions, it's so much easier, but let me still give you like the gist of it. The point is that now I have a CFT living on a particular space time, which is um, each, well, which is given by the acute metric on the brain. And you see that for T naught is smaller than one. Um, the acute metric is a big bang, big crunch universe. Um, so we have like a scaling factor, which is zero at, uh, so like when the brain comes out of the singularity and zero when it goes back into the singularity. And in between, the brain has sort of like a maximal size, if you will. And then for the T what equals to one solution, this is actually a, radi a radiation dominated Big Bang or Big Crunch, depending on the time of the time um, universe with zero cosmological constant. And these solutions in four dimensions have actually been already discussed by Hooster um, in the 2000s, um, although with like slightly uh, different sort of like philosophy behind, I would say. Great. So the question you want to ask is, do these solutions exist um, as CFG states in ADS holography? Um, and well, how can we figure this out? Well, naively, they just look like variable states, taken on small length scales. But in fact, uh, as I'll show you in a second, in those microstates, the time evolution of entropy can be not trivial. Entropy might grow or shrink. I feel like time evolution of entropy is intimately linked with spread of information or in itself an interesting um, object to study. And it's generally subject to bounds. And so it's sort of like conceivable that if I have a certain or I'm like unlucky with my choice of brain or parameter, that I violate these bounds. And if I do this, I, and if my bounds are sort of, I, I got my bounds by just like purely CFT, um, sort of like thinking. Right, then I can say, well, whatever the state is, it cannot be a state of CFT, and thereby I can rule it out. I'm just gonna skip a little sorry about this picture and jump right to how we compute um, our key surfaces. So, right, the story is sort of like now I formula what I just told you before. Let's consider region A here. So now this is what I can talk to you. So we have the aesthetic boundary here, dash line in the center is the horizon. The next solid line is the brain, and then the dotted line is where the asymptotic boundary um, would be. Now, we have two possible RT surfaces given such an interval A. The first one I will call the disconnected space because it doesn't connect to the brain. Um, and it's given by, by an RT surface like so. What we do is, or like how you get this in practice, is you go to force coordinates, you say, oh, I want my surface to be uh, on a single time slice. Um, you look at the area function, you extremize it. And now, of course, if you vary the area, technically you also get boundary terms. But these boundary terms vanish because I fix the endpoints of my area surface. Now, if you evaluate the uh, area of this surface, you have to regular, regulate it somehow and feed it back into this area functional divided by 4G Newton, you will get the well known thermal entropy of two dimension CFT um, with temperature beta. And which is related, of course, to the black hole horizon radius, um, and which depends on the width of this interval here and also on the cutoff epsilon. Now, the point I want to make here is that this solution is time independent, but it does depend and does grow um, if A is large linearly with um, size of A. If the second phase and the connected phase, and here, um, how, I, how do I get those? 
I use the kind of the translation symmetry in the transverse direction. My main answer square R just only depends on, on my y coordinate and my t coordinate. Um, and I can solve uh, extremize the area functional. And what I find is like a class of solutions which depend on a certain charge, um, what they call it QE for Q extremal, which is sort of given in terms of the trajectory that my brain takes. Now, in that case, though, my RT surface um, or the variation of the area functional has boundary terms at the SW boundary. Those vanish again because I fix my RT surface here, but I don't want to fix it on the brain. So I'll let, uh, let it fluctuate as much as I want. Um, but in order for the corresponding surface to be a true extreme, those boundary terms still to vanish. And that translates in the case of like t smaller than one, where these, these uh, frames which is a constant y, that just translates to the fact that this q must be zero. And more generally speaking, um, the statement is that um, the RT surface or the tangent vector to the RT surface at the brain must be normal to the brain. What kind of symmetry is responsible for, responsible for this uh, answer quantity? Um, that's that that's that's just the fact that your metric doesn't depend exclusively that's fine. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so the point is that this solution here um depends on time. Uh, it's not super obvious from here, um, but it depends on time due to the way I anchor the surface on the asymptotic boundary, uh, which I do at a constant radius of Schwarzschild time, which in first of coordinates gets a time dependent factor. And secondly, it doesn't depend on the size of A. Um, and so, if I want, I can always be in the space of my RT surface just by making A really large. I right? the, the, the thermal, so like sort of disconnected um, surface grows, um, and that and that limit where I make A large. But this here is like this is not a fact, so I can always go to like a very large region limit, and this will always happen. Okay. Uh -huh. So, yeah, did you have to knock out there between the connected and disconnected one to decide which one? Right. So, usually what you would do is you would do the computation for like you fix your area or area or your region A, and you would compute both and you would see, okay, which one is the smaller one, check out the area, divide it for G, and it fixes the energy. Um, right. And then here, just like you have a small region, you make it bigger, then this initially, like before this, before this takes over, it might be this phase. If you make a bigger, this approximately grows linearly, which is just the statement that it looks like a thermal state with extensive entropy. Right. Um, and then at some point, there's this space position where it suddenly does depend on the side. Of the okay. Right. Okay. So let's uh, change the image a bit. I already motivated before that somehow entropy, uh, RT surface is actually just like evolution of information. And we want to talk about bounds on the evolution of information. And so the first question is how do we even quantify you know, like information spread or or what's the interesting objects to look at if we want to talk about how entropy is changed? There's essentially two at least I'm aware of, which are interesting, and they appear to like similar variants to what I will use them in the literature before. One is the information velocity. Um, it's not like really a well-defined, at least as far as I know, um, term, but Something very close to what I have in mind has appeared in this paper. And morally speaking, it's the speed of which I have to increase the size of the region such that I do not lose information. So I imagine that it's a region, there's some right, quantity I can compute about my quantum state in that region. And then how fast as time evolves, do I have to increase the size of my region such that I do not lose information? And the second is what's called the entanglement velocity, velocity in quotation marks, because it really isn't a physical velocity, it's just this limit. Um, or maybe not t to infinity, but t at late times of the derivative of the entanglement of fixed region A divided by the equilibrium entropy density and divided by um, the volume of the boundary of the region A. Important for us here are two things I just want to quickly clarify. First of all, it's obvious from here, right, that if I want to get a non trivial bound on any of those aspects, I really need either. As we'll see a phase transition in the first case, or I need to be in the connected phase because that was the one that depended on time. Uh, the thermal one just like gives zero here. So I need to go to this large region limit that I talked about before. And then secondly, like these limits are like late times and so on won't cut it for us. We need sort of like a no local notion 
of entanglement velocity and information velocity. So, so information velocity. Um, again, right, so the smallest velocity with which I have to increase this is region A, in order not to lose information. I was like formally define it like this the derivative of this increasing area over the boundary, over the volume of the boundary. Now, the question, of course, is what do we mean by losing information? And I will make a holographic definition of what I mean by losing information. And that is a phase transition connected from this to this phase. Why would I say I'm losing information? The reason is entanglement wedge reconstruction, which I introduced in the beginning. Here, you should be able to reconstruct everything that's sort of like behind the horizon in the shaded region in this region A. Whereas here, I cannot do this anymore because it's outside of my entanglement wedge. So I've lost the yeah. this formula from Mosin and Hartmark. So this year would be Mosin and Hartman. This year is not Mosin and Hartman. It's sort of like, Morally, just like writing this statement in, in words. The Volta and Hartman, um, they, they compute this one. Well, again, right? I mean, this idea of information velocity appears like in a bunch of different uh, ways in literature, and people like usually use like different things by it. Um, but I think it's like a nice phrase for like this idea. Of, you know, like how fast you have to increase the size of a region or not to lose information, but of course, it depends on what you that information. So, just to give you another example, um, you might call so people compute another quantity of information spread, which is called butterfly velocity, which is not of interest to us here. And that can, for example, be computed in a similar fashion where you have like an operator which creates an expectation which falls, say, to the point hole, and you ask how fast you have to increase the size of my region such that my uh, entanglement wedge still captures the expectation. Which is the and that's a side question, but uh, people recently interested in the situation of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, do not, uh, uh, they sacrifice basically the, the entirety, but they have the, uh, they have the property which uh, in a product would be preserved. Strong oh, oh, yeah, you mean like, like isometries? They they look at like yeah. Uh, so they, they sacrifice basically the entire. So yeah. The work that you are mentioning here basically based on that. Yeah. You're finding the. It's 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 a really good question. Yeah. Um, so the question is now what would be the uh, criteria for there? Right. Um. Okay. I mean, if you want to ask the question after the talk, I can give you a more extensive answer to this. But let me say for now that here we're dealing with the CFT. Which is unit as unitary time mm -hmm. So whatever we're doing is intrinsically unitary. Now there is an interesting question, and that is the effect of theory on the brain. You know, is that also unitary? Because that's so like an emergent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And the answer is maybe not. And maybe it has to do with say the paper by cover and Strominger. Um, right and there they even use one of those, what they use kind of a local model criteria space, for example, to exactly argue that, you know, maybe not. But yeah, no, that's, a, that's an interesting question, for sure. Okay, the, the, the quick point I want to make here is that this information, of course, just like sort of like naturally is bounded just from locality and relativity, has to be smaller than the speed of light, right? Because if I increase the size by the region of the speed of light, I can always evolve back um, to my old region. I haven't lost any information, so um, yeah. And then there's entanglement velocity. Um, now, what I'll use is local entanglement velocity. So I don't look at this at late times, or often I look at this at times at least larger than the thermal scale. And you can prove for local entanglement velocity, and that's not due to me, but due to Nima, Kam, Jenny, and Tom Hartman. I think that's a nice paper. Um, that, in fact, this local entanglement velocity in two dimensions is bounded by the cotange uh, of pi over volume of beta. And for large region that's limited we're in, we can sort of make this bound as tight as we want. Um, right, we're just like choosing a sufficiently large bound. We essentially can get this here. Now that that argument um, uses a lot of information about the fact that we're in two dimensions, so it's somewhat of like harder to to really get the signal I really need in the higher dimensions. Um, this is why I introduced this information velocity um, concept before. Um, the proof uses 
much as a relative entropy, explicit, the explicit forms of thermal module Hamiltonian for an interval, and that's the thing we really only know in uh, two dimensions. And like the symmetries of like time translation variance and like invariance under changes of size of A of the two entropy computations I did before. And in view of time, I will not talk to you through the proof. But just before yeah. that, just a bit, uh, sorry, you, you probably said, uh, I guess that's a lot of two different between partial sub t and partial velocity sub t. Wait, partial sub t and partial velocity sub t. Oh, sorry. Yes, this is a derivative with respect to short full time t. Uh -huh. And this is the boundary of A. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's maybe not the, not the yes. best uh, okay. <laughs> notation. I agree. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to like not talk into the detail of the proof. If somebody's interested, uh, just ask me later. Now, uh, I totally do. Um, okay, and so let's let's go to like the last right and see. We have the bounds. We now have the entropies. So now I can show you a bunch of like pretty pictures, um, and you can see what I'm right. Let's first look at the little solution for t naught smaller than one. Right, the Andros diagram looks something like this. Here's the brain. Here's the boundary, and here I've drawn a family of arcs surfaces. Which connect the brain to the boundary. Um, as advertised, they're perpendicular to the brain, like our boundary condition instructed us to do. And then we can plot, say, the renormalized entropy, which is just the disconnected minus the connected phase. That's simply to get rid of the UV divergence in the solution. And then I added some random constant just to make it look nice. Um, and so what we see is that at t equals to zero, the uh, entropy is like very small, then it has this phase of quadratic growth and then continues to grow linearly. And this sort of a usual behavior of entanglement entropy um, after, after like a quench, for example, where you have this quadratic growth phase. And then at times of order beta, which is one here, you enter this linear region. Okay, now let's look at our uh, bounds. It turns out that the condition to always stay in the connected phase. Is given by this inequality here. And it's not very hard to convince yourself that once you're in the connected phase and then you start increasing um, your, your area with, at the speed of light, um, you stay in the connected phase. So it looks like a totally reasonable CFT. Second, and you can kind of see this from this picture, the entanglement velocity is bounded from above by one. You see it here, right? Like it's zero, obviously, that there is a zero here, and then it just kind of like approaches one. You can see this one's like six to zero, six to zero. So it's like the slope here is one, it approaches the slope one from below. Okay, so that's a completely healthy and reasonable state. And in fact, all those geometries, the two dimensions, you can actually get from usually past zero. So, you know, I don't know, maybe you want to say that that's not very surprising, but in any case, it's good to know. Now, here we have solutions to T naught equals zero. And as you can see, I cut off the entirely part of the boundary here. Now, my RT surface look sort of like a bit wonky because they have to end at the right angle. The brain node, this doesn't look like the right angle, but that's because the right angle is like perpendicular in the Lorentzian signature. That's how that looks like. And there's a few things to note about this. First of all, the RT surfaces. Um, can only end on the brain if you're sort of like in the lower half of the boundary here. Now, up here, there's no RT surface which can actually connect to this brain. None of those surfaces will uh, actually extremize the area functional. And so, up here, I can only have RT surface in the disconnected phase. What's even more worrying is the fact that down here, I have a finite renormalized entropy, like say for this red surface down here, at a finite time. Now, now up here, um, it's well, you'll, you'll see it on the, in the next plot. But um, what happens here is that the area of this surface, as it reaches the top corner here, grows to be infinite. So at a later finite time, the renormalized area is infinite. And so clearly, the rate of growth between these two finite times at some point, um, well, has to diverge. And if we just plot it, renormalized entropy versus uh, boundary type of the Schwarzschild coordinates. You see that sort of not much happens before approximately t equals to zero. And then suddenly my entropy blows up. And so clearly this violates all the bounds we had. And so we need to conclude that this state in that form is simply unvisible. Okay, 
Great. So that was still like for the warm up. Um, we are, so we have like, okay, do we get five more minutes? Okay. Um, now we can deal with the DGP coupling. Um, in 2D, of course, it's uh, not really like interesting to add a map and every term. Um, but instead, because it's topological, right? But instead, what we can do, we can add, say, a gigabyte in this frame. Now, what it does is it modifies the area functional I need to extremize in order to, to find the correct RT surfaces. And um, something else interesting happens, right? Remember that from the variation of this guy, we get a boundary term, which we had to set to zero. But now it has to cancel a term coming from the dilaton. And so the boundary condition now tells us that the this charge for the RT surface ending in a particular time tau brain at the RT surface is, is given by this. So it depends on, on the solution of our dilaton. Well, what's the solution of our dilaton? You know, solve the equations of motion. Um, long story short, um, the solution looks like this. It's a constant piece which sort of takes care of this inhomogeneity here in the equation, <coughs> plus some free parameter phi one times sine of tau. Um, for those who are familiar with JTB um, gravity, this really describes uh, the dilaton on you know, the inside of a JT black hole between the outer and the inner horizon. Now, um, so much before, right, the charge here becomes now a function of the brain time. And I will take the factor that appears here. So this is this free parameter phi one divided by G brain times the bulk G Newton. I will call this whole combination here just alpha. And that's going to be the parameter, which a priori we can completely choose freely. But now I will use sort of the bounds we derived before to constrain it. Um, second note, the solution, the whole solution is a symmetry under tau goes to minus tau and alpha goes to minus alpha. So I'll just discuss positive alpha and then you can flip all the pictures in your hat um, in order to get the other situation. All right, so how does it look like? This is just for increasing values of alpha. What you see is that first, the RT surfaces you know, start ending not at like equal spacing anymore, where they sort of get bunched up weirdly down here. And then at some critical value, they start falling into the past singularity. And the RT surfaces here um, on all the boundary only cover part of the brain. Now, the fact that the times at the brain and the times at the boundary sort of become asymmetric, of course, opens the possibility that the entanglement velocity now might become bigger. And in fact, if we plot this, and I'm going to tell you which those alpha those are, um, what we see is here, if alpha is sufficiently small, we get the same plot we had before. We got a growth phase, and then like linear growth um, would be approximately one. But as I increase um, alpha to the sort of like olive colored and then the orange colored um, um, case, we see that there's a, like an early phase around t equals to zero where the entropy grows faster than uh, with the cost of the that we want. Like the scope here is bigger than one. Now you can do the same computation for a different value for uh, y brains, so like a different value for tension. And you see that as I move my brain closer to the asymptotic boundary, this effect becomes like less pronounced. Okay, so after this, Yes, we get a violation for some value of the parameter. Now, how do we find this? The answer is in those plots. You see, for the blue curve here, the asymptotic value of one is approached from below, whereas for the orange curve, you're at a low velocity, you're at a high velocity, much bigger, or like, not much, but bigger than one, and then you approach the asymptotic value of one from above. So we just require that the asymptotic value is approached from below to an asymptotic expansion. And we find this very simple expression here. We need to require that the coefficient here is positive. And if you analyze this and you do the same thing for the time reflected solution, you get a bound of the absolute value of alpha, which is one over one plus sine by brain. And that also qualitatively um, sort of like shows you that the closer y brain is to negative one, uh, sorry, sine by brain is to negative one, the looser this bound actually becomes. Okay, however, there's a second bound in the situation, and that's given um, by the fact that here RT is somehow exit out the singularity. 
But you can look at this now in global coordinates. Right? Remember, in AS3, there are no, no singularities. So everything that is is only a coordinate singularity. So where do these vertices actually go? It turns out they go to, to the boundary somewhere down here, which is sort of covered by this patch. Now, if that happens, then of course, um, it's very likely that there's another sort of RT surfaces which sort of can enter through the singularity and end up addressing the boundary or And you can look at this and you find, yes, there are those solutions. And in the case of positive alpha, they happen sort of like down here. Here, I've just shifted the whole picture by like higher than two up. So this point here, this point up here. Um, and so you see that for regions down here, I'm just going to up here. It's going to be our T surface emanating, which fall into the singularity and end on the brain, sort of like back here in what I would call like the previous universe. Now, in the spirit of RT, we of course need to know which one of those is the smallest um, um, areas that's the true entropy. And so we can plot it now for all possible RT surfaces, and we see the following picture. That if we start from like very early times, and we look at how the we know what entropy evolves. It follows sort of like the lower, like this this curve down here, like a spike. And then here, suddenly the artists can't go to the past universe anymore, and there's a discontinuous jump in my entropy. And of course, that violates all our velocity bounds very clearly. Now, how do we find the value of this bound? Essentially, by realizing that the artista has defined a map. From brain time to boundary time, which is one to one, if they're sort of like not multiple RT surfaces for a given boundary time. Now, when they're at some point, additional RT surfaces develop. And if you sort of stare at the data long enough, you realize the first point in time where this develops is actually tau equals minus pi over two, or Schwarzschild time equals minus infinity. And so you can require that, or you can you can check sort of when. Is there a saddle point developing in this map? And you'll find a bound again, you this for like both, um, both alpha positive and alpha negative. You find a bound which bounds alpha uh, from above uh, by one over one minus sign rate. Before it was a plus, plus, a, a plus now it's a minus. Um, right, and so these are the bounds. So, in summary, what we've seen is first of all that the radiation dominant cosmology. Um, wasn't a valid state. And then we've obtained bounds for the GP doublings of two dimensional level microstates, and they came from like two sources either the entanglement velocity for our two surfaces within the same patch and became too fast. Now, in the limit of our interests, so where T goes to one, this bound becomes like really loose. And there's one from sort of these new RT sets that appear that connect to previous universes through the singularity. And this bound becomes actually. Height as we send t to one and bounds this combination alpha, so t Newton times phi over t Newton times brain um, by one half. Now you can of course argue, well, do we actually want to trust this bound? Or shouldn't we right? Shouldn't we not like interpret the, the black hole as sort of well, like the, the current singularity is the true singularity, and everything that touches it, we just don't care about anymore. And uh, maybe. But in higher dimensions, and I haven't really talked about higher dimensions, um, actually both of these effects persist with an important twist, namely that you also develop new RT surfaces, but they are now in the same coordinate patch. And so um, I think that's sort of like indirect maybe evidence to really take it seriously. Um, although in this case, it's not, it's not clear yet, at least whether they actually get the tighter bounds around. Okay, and then that's sort of all I want to say. Let me just finish with some of the questions. Sorry for going a bit over time. Um, open questions, of course, are what's the situation in higher dimensions? Um, the issue here is that this bound of the entanglement velocity we have is probably a bit too weak because in higher dimensions, the upper bounds are believed um, to be this, and they're proved like this is proven in certain um, holographic contexts. Um, but the point is, this here is one for d equals to two, and for higher d, it's smaller than one. Um, actually, for he goes to 50 as the first one half. Second question is can we actually rescue this t equals to one solution, which we ruled out, maybe by adding like a finite, uh, fine tuned version of plus one gravity? Of course, it's a uh, flat space, so we probably want to add something like CJHS gravity. 
Um, then another question we're sort of interested in right now is, uh, can we turn this around? Can we, you know, can we do something where you give me the time, um, uh, the evolution of entropy of like a large interval, and I tell you, oh, that corresponds to you know this cosmology maybe behind the horizon. But yeah, and then there's like a bit more like out there questions. Can we understand these bounds maybe the complementary way from that holography, so from the effective field theory on the brain? Can we use this to rule out existing constructions? So there are constructions we'll try to construct cosmologies using negative EGP couplings. Can we somehow exclude those solutions? Um, and then how does this translate to like EGP couplings and other constructions, like the one I showed in the beginning? Um, where I don't have like an obvious way of doing an analytic continuation. Um, can we do something similar there? Are there more rounds of complexity, et cetera, et cetera? All right, thanks. There's a high pleasure to see your code, right? On this page, I'd be able to see it on this table. Yeah, but the, well, but the exponent's also here. I mean, if you take the oh, oh, it's right. Right. Yeah, so, sorry, I, I should have. The, the mouse isn't like a really unfortunate location. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, how about uh, studying this in the form of the class? Um, how do you, what do you have in mind? So, to have the deformation of the hmm. right. So we're like right. So you could like imagine there being like a general potential for for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean that's like um an interesting question. That's like totally valid to discuss. The reason um we picked JT gravity here is well, that's the simplest, obviously. <laughs> and second, um, that's what usually happens in those Dalby hot, like people usually use those Dalby holographic hot. So the, the story I told you in the beginning about the Adam Formian sign and so on, it was first discussed in an AGS3 model with JT gravity on the brain. And so that's sort of like, you know, like that's where you start. And then, um, but yeah, that was a good question, right? I, uh, I have no, no, no insights on that. There are no questions that are sex. Uh,